This is a tough one today. Is it? I think so. He seemed like a very nice guy. Everyone loved this guy. Luke Perry passed away today due to complications from a stroke at the age of 52. Obviously, he was in 90210. He was in the new show Riverdale. He played Archie's father. Uh, he He's was the last person to pretend to care about Shannon Doherty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> today, is a bad day. today is a bad day for TV fans and a great day for all the horny women in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> he was hot. He was hot. This heart throbs heart is no longer throbbing. <laughs> Luke Perry had great versatility as an actor. He could play a hot bad boy or a hot good boy or a hot bull rider or a hot dad or... You get the picture. <laughs> Luke Perry was such a good actor, he made it look like Jason Priestley could actually throw a punch. <laughs> and Tori Spelling. <laughs> uh, roast in peace, Luke Perry, 90210. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, Luke. Welcome, everybody, to Thick Skin with Jeff Ross. Uh, life is hard. We're getting through it together. I don't know if I got a cold or allergies, but I'm all right. I'm still feeling good. Cousin Ed. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing all right. I went to the allergist. Have you ever been to an allergist? When I was a child, they stuck me with a thousand needles. I always had weird allergies as a kid, so I went to the allergist. He told me I'm allergic to corn, pears, and shrimp. That's... Shrimp? I, That's it, awful. It's not, because it doesn't bother me. It's a very minor allergy. The one that bothers me is corn, because my jokes are so full of it. <laughs> I'm so excited for this episode, because somebody I really admire, if you're a fan of Seinfeld, Bruno... Or Borat, the Sasha Baron Cohen movies. Curb Your Enthusiasm. One of the top dogs on that show. This is a great mind, a great director. Um, Larry Charles is coming into the bunker in just a few minutes. He has a new documentary, four-part documentary, that really struck me. It's called The Dangerous World of Comedy. It just premiered on Netflix. And what I love about it is how it... <sighs> It sort of encapsulates the idea of doing comedy in painful environments. It's a must-see as far as I'm concerned. It blew my mind. Yeah, he traveled all over the world to war zones, to dictatorships, to understand what makes people laugh over there. And uh, I, I'm just, just really excited to ask him a million questions. He's coming up in just a second. And... Um, I want to remind everybody that I will be in Oxnard this weekend. I've never been to Oxnard. Not really sure where it is. It's somewhere in California. It's a scary name. Oxnard? Yeah. Because, you know, nards are testicles. And ox, I mean, you don't want to get anywhere near an ox's testicles. That joke was <laughs> oxnarded. <laughs> so that'll be fun. I'll be there this Saturday, March 9th, doing stand up, working on new material. Selling um, these new T-shirts. Oh, yeah. Show it off. It says, I'm offended by people that are always offended, which is something I guess I said once somewhere <laughs> on a more popular podcast than this one. And they'll be available for sale on the website next week, roastmastergeneral.com. So is that right? Out there, yeah. Oh, that'll be fun. No, it'll be great. It's patriotic, freedom of speech. That's what this show is all about. Amen, brother. I like to uh, start off with some touchy subjects. Touchy subjects. subjects. What's first? Well, there's a new comedian on the block. Uh huh. Stormy Daniels <laughs> catching some heat on Twitter for uh, from some comedians because she's headlining a night at a comedy club in Houston, Texas. Right. Some comedians think that she should just uh, earn her stripes before she starts booking big gigs. Yeah. So I mean, I, I saw this on Twitter. Yeah. Um, 
couple comedians went after her for taking up stage time. Yeah. And trying to pretend that you can just jump the line and be a comedian because you decide to be in a comedian. Mm -hmm. And I'm like all for it. Yeah. Comedians come from other places. We don't we're not born a comedian necessarily. And people are giving her a hard time and 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 um somebody said stay in your lane. You know? Yeah. The comedian Eddie If told Eddie her to Ift. stay in her yeah. lane. And I'm like I don't know. She's a 50-year-old porn star. That lane is a dead end. Yeah, it's whatever she wants to do. Like she's probably funny. And I don't think she's claiming to be a great comedian. I think she's just claiming she has a few fun stories to tell. And she's performing in Texas. I know more people know who Stormy Daniels is than Eddie Ift. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lori Kilmartin, who's very funny, she started this. She, she, she had a reaction to it. Well, uh, Stormy Daniels responded by saying, Wow, so supportive. I am an actual female. But I never get women who just tear other women down. Yeah, so this became like a female-on-female female thing. Yeah. And there's been a lot more people getting mad at her. You know, it's not, it's not the only thing. I think people just like messing with Stormy Daniels. I think once you jump, jump into, the, into the MAGA world, you, you open yourself up to uh, yeah. all sorts of Twitter spats and real spats. And I mean, she knows that she's going to get people yelling at the show. She deals with it everywhere she goes. Yeah. So I think it takes balls, man, to get up on stage and to go for it. Well, she definitely doesn't have balls, but <laughs> she's got boobs and she's got guts. And she probably has thick skin, having survived in the porn business and now, mm -hmm. you know, taking on Trump in the courts of law and, and the courts of public opinion. Yeah. Um, well, someone else just tweeted her too, right? Yeah, lots of people have been going nuts. Uh, there's a, The Hill tweeted an article where they say that she's doing a nationwide stand-up tour when uh, she responded. She's like, I, I've seen some terrible excuses for journalism this year, but this is absolutely repulsive and nothing, uh, and, and nothing but you want to print my name for attention. The opening sentence is a flat-out lie. My rep told you it wasn't true. One book comedy gig is not a tour. She is doing 20 strip clubs, though, uh, as a stripper. Lori Kilmartin responded, Wow, Stormy, no wonder Donald Trump broke up with you. <laughs> Which is funny. <laughs> and Stormy went right back to it. No wonder you can't get enough gigs. Try spending time doing something productive instead of trolling me on the Internet and stewing with jealousy. It's not healthy. Uh, yeah, Stormy, man. She seems right she every seems, time she talks. <laughs> I, I, I feel like I feel like she's like uh, the an ultimate roast. I got to get her at the next roast. I mean, she's roastable and she looks like she can dish it out. Mm. Anyway, good luck with your gig, Stormy, wherever it is. It's at the Joke Joint Comedy Club in <laughs> Houston, Texas. <laughs> right. Someone said, "Well, she's taking you know gig away," but. That club doesn't even book any other, has no other lady comedians on the bill except Stormy Daniels. Oh, so, they have Colleen Justice. Oh, okay. Is doing it uh, on uh, March 15th. Right, I don't want to plug these fucking gigs at this point. <laughs> <laughs> What's next? What's next? Oh, man. Now, this is a true touchy subject. The HBO documentary Finding Neverland is yeah, coming out. Uh -huh. Wade Robson and James Safechuck are accusing Michael Jackson of molesting them when they were younger. And uh, apparently the documentary is brutal and four hours long. Uh. Oprah's on their side. Corey Feldman came out saying that this is not the Michael he knew. What do you think? Is Michael done? Can we listen to his music anymore? This is a classic story of he said, he, he said. <laughs> I don't know, man. Uh, this is tricky. I never. You, well, you don't go anywhere without hearing Michael Jackson music. Yeah. Every bar mitzvah, there's boys and girls dancing to Michael Jackson forever, for all of time. No one's even. But I must admit that every time I hear it now, I start to go there in my head first. Really, it does put a weird spin on it. But we knew about this for thirty years. 
Right. You know, at least. People say, I'm going to hear the whole story. It's 30 years we're hearing the whole story. Yeah. It goes back and forth. <laughs> but he went. He was on trial for a very long time. He settled with, um, with some kid um, for $22 million, someone who's not in on this. Uh, 22 mil. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know. <sighs> You don't give someone $22 million for no reason. Oh Michael Jackson's God. maid yeah. is coming out and saying that she used to always catch them, like, sleeping with the kids. Not, like... Fucking them. But, like, holding them and laying in the bed with them Ugh. and stuff like that. I mean, it's not good. <laughs> it's, this is, you know... Ugh, this yeah. is too sickening. It is very, it's very sickening. I'm though. throwing out my white gloves. That's it. <laughs> Whatever happened to that Conrad Murray guy? Is he in? He went to jail for two years. For killing Michael Jackson. For giving him drugs that killed him. All he did was give Michael ja- prescribe Michael Jackson drugs that he felt he needed. And he went to jail for two years. Michael saw nothing. Wow. I guess he saw the loss of $22 million, but... I remember when we were, when I was a kid, they had Captain EO at Disney, that 3D. Beloved. Beloved. But they took it down. Disney got rid of it because there was reports of Michael Jackson grabbing at some kid in the parks. Really? And it was just like, and it was just kind of like shoved under and like they just removed it and the story didn't break out too much. And Captain- next thing you knew, Captain EO was gone. More like Captain E. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what's next, Ed? All right. What's next is <clears throat> Steven Spielberg said he doesn't think streaming movies should be eligible for the Oscars, only Emmys. And even if uh, even if they come out in theaters before they were released on Netflix, Netflix fought back saying, we love cinema. Here are some things we also love. Access for people who can't always afford or live in towns without theaters, right. letting everyone everywhere enjoy releases at the same time, and giving filmmakers more ways to share art. These are th- these things are not mutually exclusive. That's what Netflix said. That's what Netflix said wow. in response to Spielberg. What's his reason? Because he doesn't think that like Roma got three Oscars. Right. The movie that came out this year that was on Netflix. But that was in the theaters for a short while. For two weeks. They put it out if they put it so out. So they if, follow the rules. If something's in the theater in five theaters for two weeks or less before January first, it's eligible for the Oscars. Wow. Can our can our, the YouTube version of our podcast be released in a theater for two weeks? If we can talk a theater into doing it, then we'll be el- then we'll be eligible to apply for an Oscar. Yes. Larry Charles, best supporting actor. <laughs> He'll be in this seat in just a couple seconds. I know that Spielberg's getting older and you know, Jews do complain more with <laughs> age. <laughs> yeah, man. And then Scorsese, his buddy, his boy, he's got a big Netflix movie coming out this year. That he's the Irishman. Gonna, that he's going to want to push for an Oscar. You know, he's got to be like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, man. Hmm, I don't know. Maybe Steve should stay in his lane like dinosaurs in the Holocaust. <laughs> <laughs> I love Steven Spielberg. Oh, man. He always looks out for filmmakers. So it is interesting that he's he taken, does. taking this stand. Yeah, I mean, he changed a lot of things. He invented PG-13. Did you know that? Huh. With uh, Indiana no. Jones and uh, Temple of Doom. Really? Yeah, they uh, there was no PG-13 before that movie, and they wanted to give it an R rating, and he was just like, no, so figure it out. You know? <laughs> so then they came up with PG-13 because oh. he refused to have an R rating. <laughs> wow. That's how much you know he's got clout. I mean, he, that's 1983 clout. He's got crazy clout now. And Spielberg, I mean, he works with everybody. I don't know. I don't think he's right. I think Roma deserved every little bit it got. I think it deserved more than it got, personally. It was the best movie, one of the best movies I saw this year. Oh, great. And then when I was about to put it in the, and watch it with friends, you're like, it's too long and boring. Don't watch it. I, the people so that now, were here would I didn't have hated watch it. it. I didn't watch it. You could watch it whenever you want. It's on Netflix. It's black and white, and it's subtitled, and it's about a maid. So I, I for a party of... Drunk people, I would say it's probably not the best decision, uh, but I truly love that it. it's beautiful. Wow! Yeah, you got to check it out. There's a great uh, fight scene in it. Oh yeah, yeah. If you could stick it out for two hours, there's a great <laughs> fight scene in it. <laughs> All right. Well, 
What else? Uh, this one's just a fun one. A parrot stuck on a roof keeps telling firefighters to fuck off every time they try and rescue it. What? There is a parrot stuck on the roof. This is where? In, this is in England. And it was it's a blue macaw parrot. Jesse is the name of the parrot. Wow. And a fire team tried to rescue it. And every time the fireman got close, it was like, fuck off, fuck off, fuck off. And they even brought it a bunch of food and a nice really? towel. And then finally it flew to another and it flew to another roof. It was stuck on the roof for three days. In the parrot's defense, the fireman was eating chicken wings when he told the fuck off. <laughs> just mean. You should have seen what he heard what he said when they asked him for one of the cracker. <laughs> <laughs> fuck off, fuck off. Ugh. I saw the fireman. I think the parrot let him off easy. Oh, really? <laughs> um, I love being a comedian. I have a small part in this dangerous world of comedy documentary. Yeah. That's on Netflix right now. It's my, my part is an interview about Bob Hope and performing in war zones, which I've had a taste of over the years. Um, so with no further ado, I think we should bring out our guest, Larry Charles, great filmmaker, great guy, um, the dangerous world of comedy. On Netflix right now, here's the trailer. It's a dangerous world, filled with hate and violence and war, and amazingly enough, comedy. When you are not funny, you are what in English? You are not funny. <laughs> Can you make a living as a comic in Iraq? Or how do you break into comedy in Somalia? Oh, Look, yes. now, Google it, please Google it. It takes brave people to make dangerous comedy. It's a therapy. The little laughter takes away the stress. Comedians and actors and TV and filmmakers who make comedy in places where it doesn't belong. Get people to laugh just a little about that which might be the most sacred. Then we might get them to open up a little bit. Veterans have a sick sense of humor. That's how we deal with the job we gotta right. do. I don't know you girls know this, but you know, once you go cooked, you're hooked. <laughs> I am so just delighted. I have a true comedy superstar in the bunker in my house today. It makes me so happy. Uh, Larry Charles is here. Um, just say hi, Larry. Hi. Thank you so much, Jeff. I'm so happy to be here. Really a pleasure. <laughs> it's an honor. Why did you use like a fake rich guy voice for a second? <laughs> that is my voice. I'm, uh, that's my voice. I've been working on it for years. Are you kidding? I wanted Larry to come because there's a new documentary on netflix it's four parts it's called the dangerous world of comedy i always say they're like you know there's there's comedy and then there's about comedy and you made this new documentary that's sort of both it's about comedy but it's also very funny and i'm watching it and it's like i am the demo for this thing you went to all these war zones and depressed places and dictatorships and you were like is there comedy is comedy alive in these places, you know, it reminds me of Springsteen when he goes, is anybody out there alive tonight? <laughs> and you found the life, the light in all these dark places like Liberia and Iraq and Syria. Yeah, I didn't get into Syria, but, but I you did, tried. Yes, tried to get into Syria. And I'm watching this thinking, you know, I thought I was like a little bit of a badass once in a while. I did a show in a jail. <laughs> he, Ed is and a, I, he is a badass. You are a badass. I've been to Iraq a few about? times and Djibouti and some war zones. And then I see you rolling in and you don't even you're you don't look like a journalist you look like the devil's <laughs> rabbi <laughs> An anointed yeah yeah and you've done like badass adventures before for people who don't know for people who aren't comedy experts larry charles is he directed um borat and bruno and religious movies that that bother people not everybody. Most people think they're hilarious, but it's <laughs> they're dangerous ideas. You know, it's the kind of thing where you really have to have your your shit together before you walk into uh, those situations. You got to know your way in, your way out. You know, in this documentary, you talk to former child soldiers in Liberia. You talk to a warlord 
Yes. In what country? That was also Liberia. Liberia. Yeah. Now, I never really think of Liberia as having a big comedy scene. <laughs> I don't want to correct you, but he's a cannibal warlord. Right, <laughs> right. Ch- a child murdering cannibal warlord. If we're going to be accurate, actually, he's child murdering cannibal warlord. Yes. Now, now, forgive me because maybe and this a funny is a, guy. maybe this is an impolite question. You're a guest in my house. Please. You know, you were also one of the principals on Seinfeld. You've been doing this a long time. You're a wealthy guy. What the fuck is wrong with you that you would want to go do this to yourself? It's a good question. I mean, I ask I ask myself that a lot, particularly sitting in the middle of a traffic jam in Mogadishu where everybody's got guns. You go, what? <laughs> well, I, I live in Malibu, you know? It's yeah. like, what am I doing here? But I felt like, um, uh, you know, the my options for what I could get made were starting to become very uninteresting to me. I see. I didn't want to make any... I had some disillusioning experiences with narrative films. I didn't want to just do another pilot or do another fictional thing. I was looking for something urgent. I also didn't want to do something with a big army of people. I wanted to strip down that process. That's cool. And so, I get that. Yeah, and so I was looking for an idea that I could enca- encapsulate all those things. And then I realized I'd been traveling all these years... Like the last couple of decades with Sasha doing uh, international commercials, huh. all kind of, with with Bill on religious, and every country I went to, there was always there was always comedians, and you know we create havoc. Sasha and I would create some havoc and some mayhem, and we'd run away, but we'd come back to America where we were like given rewards and accolades. And I kept thinking, what happens to these guys that are left behind in these oppressive regimes, you know? And so I started googling. Somalia and comedy, or you know whatever. What cre- comes up? Comedians. Before you making this documentary, I can't imagine much came up. Exactly. There, but they're there. Comedians in other parts of the world that really have no connection to us that we don't know anything about. They know everything about us. The right. Somalian comedians, Liberian comedians, they know Eddie Murphy. Right. You know, but we don't know anything about them, and they're there in those oppressive places, in those war zones or post-traumatic. Uh, war zones, uh, and they are still surviving, still doing their comedy while I get to go home. So I thought that's an interesting story that I'm sort of uniquely qualified to tell. Right. Because of the way you've done guerrilla filmmaking before. Yes. I thought that I have, uh, if I have authenticity anywhere, it's like in this world, uh-huh. you know? And when I went there, I felt that also because, again, even in Palestine, People are into Seinfeld. You know, I mean, uh, yeah. I, I think I've told the story before that I was in Amman doing Bruno. And we would walk down the street. I'd walk down the street. I had to have security when I walked down the street in Amman because they said I looked too much like a rabbi, maybe the devil's <laughs> rabbi. And there would be street sellers, okay? And they'd be selling, in those days, bootleg DVDs on the street. And they're always the same group of things together, bootleg DVDs. There'd be Seinfeld bootleg. There'd be a Curb Your Enthusiasm bootleg. Wow. There'd be a Borat bootleg. And then there'd be a copy of Mein Kampf. And I never, <laughs> I could never, but always together, you know? It's really? like, enjoy the and then, you know, but it was a very interesting, so I kind of was like, you know, exposed to all this, and it seemed, again, the juxtaposition, as you've experienced yourself from your overseas travels, between the horrors and the insanity and the craziness and the violence and the laughter, those two things are very interesting. They seem juxtaposed, but they actually synchronize very well together. People need the laughter to survive the horror. And I think we have both discovered that to a large degree. I always find that, you know, you think, oh, an audience, Saturday night, they got to be drunk. They're the, that's the best crowd. The fact is, they're a great crowd, but the best crowds are the crowds that are, they have n- nothing to smile about. Exactly. I remember one time I did a show in Afghanistan. It was 2005. I was with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and there were these two guys in the front, two young soldiers, dusty fatigues, and first comics on, and it was a, an inspirational speech from Gail Sayers, and and Leanne Tweeden did something, and I'm like, these guys have not smiled once. What is up with these guys? And I said something to Chairman Myers. He's like, I don't know. And I, and I asked the commanding officer, um, what's up with these guys in the front row? Why are they in the front so miserable? Everybody else is cheering and having fun. This might have been in uh, 
in a forward operating base, sort of an unnamed, maybe it was, I think we were in Kandahar, actually. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, their buddy uh, died yesterday, and they had the funeral this morning. I go, well, that's terrible. Why are they in the front row of my fucking comedy show? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, I like to work the crowd. Can you fucking move them in the back? Like, this is our fifth show. Could you, like, help a brother out? Yeah. <laughs> gave them, like, they gave them ringside seats, basically. And, you know, yeah. th you know, if this was a Don Rickles show, this would be where the Asian and the Mexican would sit. Like. <laughs> is he looking at me? Is he looking at me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so now uh, I, I, I realize, like... I, I have this mission. I, I'm focusing on, I'm up next, I go on, and now I'm the only one who knows this, and I'm, I don't want to talk about that, but I wanted to make these guys laugh, and it took me a solid, you know, four or five minutes into my act where I finally got them laughing, and I would normally not talk about what's right in front of me. I always talk about stuff back home and try to make this an escapist experience, but what I learned that by the time the, the show was over, these guys really were laughing, but it was cathartic laugh it was like almost like through the tears kind of laughing and i feel like there's all types of comedy that is the most rewarding when you agree. get a joke to penetrate a bulletproof vest or a helmet those kevlar laughs yeah 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 now, now you translate that to some of the places you went to um and I watched all four episodes of The Dangerous World of Comedy at once. I binged it, which is a fun thing to do on a yeah, rainy hopefully. Saturday. I'm glad. But Thank you, you also, I don't absorb it in the same way. So you start to look at the bigger messages and not right. always the smaller ones. True. And one of the thing, things that I, I, I was reminded of, which I really appreciated, was that comics in many of these places were like the way show folk were a hundred years ago in America, <laughs> they were the scum of the earth. Yes, they're street. They're street perform. They're, they right. don't have Royal Albert Hall in right. in, in, in Iraq. You got to no. perform in a place that could get blown up any second. There's no career path. That's one of the biggest differences between American comedy and the rest of the world. There's no career path for a Liberian comedian. <laughs> It's like life or death. Those are the two career paths. You know, you're not making a pilot. You're not doing a stand-up special. You're not doing an HBO show. You know what I mean? You are basically trying to just live, and you feel this calling to do the comedy. And I also believe, by the way, f from observing all this, and I think this is what you're observing also in your experiences, laughter is not like a, a, a trifling thing. It's not a frivolous thing. It's actually an essential part of the human nature. Right. I put it up there really after my experiences with breathing and eating and sleeping. If you don't laugh, if you don't find humor in a situation, then you are staring at the abyss and you have nothing stopping you from jumping over the side. It's the, la it's the idea of stepping back and realizing the absurdity and being able to laugh at it that enables you to go on, you know? And I think for the audiences and for the comedians in these countries and for what you do when you go overseas as well, it's this healing process that is essential for people to perpetuate their lives at all. Otherwise, they've lost meaning. They lose significance, you know? One of the things that really impressed me was, with, was your empathy. Now, when I went into the jail and roasted inmates, I didn't ask what their crime was. <laughs> I didn't prejudge people. I treated everybody the same, whether they were in there for not paying their child support or there was a guy who I found out later, you know, murdered a professor, college professor, and I treated them the same way. You're talking to child soldiers, former child soldiers in Liberia who now do street comedy. Yes. And I had watched that scene twice. Yeah. This is before I knew I was going to talk to you because my, I was just like, where's the, what are they doing and what, why, why isn't he trying to get them off drug? You know, all the, all the liberal knee jerk <laughs> stuff of starts yeah. to happen to me. Like, why is he... Right, and I, was, I go. You know what? What he's doing is he's shining a light, and the rest is up to them. And we can't take care of everybody, but yet you gave them some props. Yes, I feel like comics, and I don't know how you feel. Before I'm an American, before I'm a Jew, I'm a comic. Mm -hmm. It's like a cult. Yes, I agree. And when I see somebody, I don't care that they were a child soldier in that moment. I don't care that you're talking about a cannibalistic warlord. Yeah. I'm going, wow, he's he's got 
feelings for these people who either love comedy, got through something with comedy, or are indeed themselves comedians. Yeah, it's very important. I think we tend with the with the more extreme people like the warlord. You know, people. A lot of people said to me, even my sound guy when we were there said, "Why are we doing this?" And I'm like, "Look." We see the end result of all this. We don't, you know, let's find out a little bit. I talked to an Al-Shabaab terrorist who defected. I talked to an ISIS prisoner. You know, let's find, we know what the end is. We know the violence at the end of this road. But we don't know how the road begins, really. And maybe if we found out how the road begins for these guys in their villages, they, they're, they're not being exposed to any outside world. They're being threatened. Their families are often being threatened. And of they're course. kidnapped to become ISIS. These guys are not all, you know, horrible, terrible people. People. They are victims also who are forced along in some cases and realize the the um, the error in their ways and try to undo it. And sometimes it's just too late. You know, so there's that element going on in this as well. I was curious about does that person find something funny? Did that person have laughter as a child? If they did, if things changed slightly, would their story be different? You know, it's like there's so many factors. We're like white guys in America yeah. born of a certain age. We have... You know, Buddy Hackett, we grew up knowing who Buddy Hackett was. You know who hates farts the most? <laughs> Midgets. <laughs> they live at ass height. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we had all these role models. It's like, you know, the veterans in this country that I interviewed, like Bobby Henline, who, who's burned over 40% of his body. There's a, there's a, I'll just fill people in real quick. Yeah, yeah. There, there, there's a, a new breed of, of comedian in America right now um, that, is disabled, disabled war veterans. And they're finding happiness through doing stand-up. Yeah. Most people find misery doing stand-up, <laughs> but these guys have had it so bad that they're doing stand-up. And you took some time and you showcased them. And it was one of the few times in the movie where you actually like give us the whole act. Yes, yes. Was, and they had great important. jokes. And they, they had did. great jokes. It wasn't a symbolic gesture on your part. It was a... Uh, it was very generous. You gave them some real, some real good screen time, and, and, and these guys were funny. They're going to book gigs, yes, yes, based absolutely. on the notoriety. Yeah, and that, veterans in this country have uh, uh, some, to, to see what people will go through to get yeah. a fucking Netflix special. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, stand up is the only thing that's actually better than being in combat. So I guess they look at that as a step up. But a lot of these guys, they have the structure. Being a veteran in America, even though it's woefully inadequate, the, the structure to help veterans in America, it's still still leagues beyond anything in the rest of the world. The veterans in Liberia, I mean, you're on your own from the minute, you know, the war ends. There's nobody there to help you. The country is in, in poverty and in rubble. So is uh, Somalia, for that matter. So people are left with no options. Here, there's some structure. There are hospitals. There are services. They're woefully inadequate, but they exist. And in the same way, stand-up structure exists. There's an right. infrastructure for stand-up, so a guy like Bobby Henline could go to an open mic, you know, and catch on and start to perform and find that voice, you know? He doesn't have to explain to the audience what stand-up is. Exactly. And he doesn't have to do it in a dark corner. Right, the learning curve. The, away from right. the, the military dictatorship. Exactly. There's no learning curve in America, and there's a tremendous... The people in Saudi Arabia, for instance, when they first started doing stand-up there, and it's still pretty, you know, limited... But the you spoke audience, to a Saudi Arabian comedian. Yes, I did. I the, spoke to a couple. And the problem with the audiences initially in the stand-up, they opened the stand-up club. But the problem was the audience didn't know set up punchline like we grow up with. <laughs> and so they thought pe they were being insulted. <laughs> you know, people thought they were being insulted. It took a while for the conditioning to recognize, oh, no, this is a joke. It's okay. It's a new type of music. It's a, exactly, exactly. It was jazz for a lot of those people, yes. I don't know if it's completely comparable, but what it reminded me of when I saw that was, and by the way, if th this is coming at people a little too quick, maybe we could <laughs> give them some more exposition sure. with each. But in Syria, these uh, uh, you spoke to a lady comedian, and her bits were about ladies driving. Yeah, Saudi Arabia. Which is yeah, yeah. Saudi Arabia uh, women drivers, which yes. is something that's relatable all over the world. You know, they're getting to that now. Yes. And it reminded me a little bit of talking to... Trevor Noah years ago about the early days of stand up in post apartheid South Africa. Yes. He convinced me and Ed and I went together to 
go to Johannesburg for a comedy oh, cool. festival. That's very cool. Yeah. I wanted to go there as well. I couldn't. It was too far from where I was, even in Somalia, to get there. You, Legitimately a good comedy scene. Yeah, but yeah, it's you, crazy. I had done the research. <laughs> I saw there was a lot of comedy there. Definitely, Th- there's real comedy there. In other words, it's like working comedy clubs, open mics. Yes, television. And Trevor, large who we think of yeah. as a, Trevor Noah, who we think of as a young guy, is sort of like the veteran. Up there. Yes, yes, and. And I remember it being one of the best. We went four or five days early. We had dinners with the local comics. I picked up a bunch of references. We went to Soweto a couple times. We toured Nelson Mandela's house. By the way, terrible decorator. You, know, <laughs> you hear all the good things about Nelson Mandela. Yeah. No one talks about all that right. leopard That's, skin couch. He's got to have something. And and what what struck me was how good the crowd was. Like I feel like roast comedy... Had never been heard. Stand up comedy is only 15 years old, 20 years old, tops. Before yeah. that, it was like, it was corny white guys. Sketches, stories, broad fun of, stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and, and not particularly sensitive to the racial issues they had. It would ignore all. it, if anything, yeah. or, or mock it. And I remember just getting laughs and people were standing on their seats. I started making jokes about Nelson Mandela, <laughs> and people were bugging the fuck out. Uh, and funny. I really feel like it was like a rewiring where, and we did some roast battles there with the with the local comic, not lo, I shouldn't say local, the national headliners, yes, the yes. comics that were most well known there, roast battled, and then now they're in their second season of roast battle. Oh wow! On the, on wow! The so that was Central. A, was that a new comic? Conceit for those people when yes. you first introduced completely it. Yes. new roasting. Yeah. So I did my roast of the audience in a stand-up show. I talked about police brutality. I talked about <laughs> stuff were happening that was happening in America. It continues to happen, but also brought up volunteers from the audience. A guy in a wheelchair, lady on crutches, a girl with pink hair, black, white, mixed, everything, and did a sort of uh, just like a, a speed roast, I call it. Yeah, and then we did roast battles. And <laughs> roasting is a worldwide movement, and, and 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 to see it suddenly take hold in a place, it's fun when I see it happen in Mexico and Italy and Germany, and it's in big in French Canada now in Canada, and and they're doing it everywhere, all over America. But in particularly Africa was fun because it was like about it was about talking truth to power but also taking a joke yeah things that you didn't really do openly during apartheid it's a very id like uh, exploration the roasts Uh because it allows people like if you just even go back to the friars roast it allowed people to sort of say things that shouldn't be said Uh very forbidden and at the same (laughs) time in a safe context you know so I'd imagine in places where there is like kind of underlying rage and they get a chance to to sort of uh, verbalize that Uh it's probably very cathartic laughter also i felt you know? that way yeah and yeah I, I look at it as one of the best things we ever did yeah I, that's I, so one cool of the best trips i ever had yeah yeah i can i can understand that i think again i see it again you know i, I wanted to tell you about saudi arabia also the problem when i was there there was a sense of hope going on uh, the crown prince had just really kind of come into power and the media was sort of opening up and these stand-up clubs even though they were male only we're starting to open up, and there was like a world of stand-up evolving. And I met and did an interview with the guy who was the sign. He's called the Seinfeld of Saudi Arabia. Right. Yeah, yeah. And his name is Fahad uh, Al Batari. And I had a long interview with him. I didn't wind up using it in the show, but he was married. He is married to one of the female driving activists. She's been arrested a number of times, and then recently they were both, this is after the interview, they were both arrested, and they've disappeared in Saudi Arabia. You know, you have the Khashoggi thing, you have all these journalists, you have beheadings going on there, you know, and, and stand-up at the same time. So they that's a very tense dynamic now because all this hope was sort of put out there, and now people are feeling the brunt of that kind of just driving and stuff like that, you know. So it's the, the political climate there suddenly can shift, and that's... In a lot of these countries, things can suddenly shift. The government suddenly falls. There's a counter-revolution. There's insurgency. There's there's terrorist explosions. And the whole dynamic in that scene, in whatever's left of that comedy scene, completely changes and sometimes gets destroyed. Oh. It has to be rebuilt. Why? Then, then in Saudi Arabia, for instance, what would motivate somebody to want to put their life on the line by being a st- comedian? Well, I think like the Seinfelds of Saudi Arabia, he was not a particularly 
controversial uh, comedian. Uh, and most of the comedians that I saw in the comedy clubs, uh, when it was translated for me, most of it was in Arabic, he actually performs in English as well. And a lot of Saudi Arabians uh, have English as a, as a very, very fluent second language. Yeah. So a lot of them want to perform. A lot of the, the foreign speaking, I met a Palestinian comedian, a guy named Adi Khalifa. You right. may know who he is. Um, he's, he's like D Dave Chappelle's his idol, you uh -huh. know. But they have learned English, sometimes through Seinfeld, I was told also. They use Seinfeld to learn English. And, but even in Arabic... A lot of the comedians in Saudi Arabia are not, they're not going, oh, that crown prince, man. They're not yeah. messing. Right. They're not messing with the power structure there. Right. Yeah. They're avoiding that in order to stay safe. Because huh. that's a place where the religious police will storm into this club and just take you and pull, pull you off the stage. And that's the end. You know, but everyone you, there is Lenny Bruce. Exactly. Well, but the thing is that they really are avoiding. But they're not even trying to be. Exactly. Just but in other words, every benign joke is if you slip. Yes. If someone just decides you're not funny and wants to say you said something. Yes. And, you know, like in, in America, we can, you talked about this a little bit, but Bob Hope's, you know, e e e even the big American comedians now, we can say, well, I, I, I'm an equal opportunity offender. In Saudi Arabia, it doesn't matter. Yeah, that's You only right. have to offend one, the wrong yeah. person one time. You can say, well, I'm also making fun of the opposite. No. Doesn't matter. Doesn't no. matter. And in all these countries, that's also very true. There is uh, a no going back. You know, the, the very act of stand-up, the very act of doing comedy itself in these countries is the radical revolutionary act. Just even if it is not politically uh, oriented, it is still a revolutionary act to be trying to make people laugh. And so the comedians that really do go right to the government or go uh, right to ISIS I and love Iraq. This. I love the, that. Those guys are, you know, they are will as, as I've learned, they told me many times, I'm willing to die. You know, I'm willing to die to make this country a better. I'm Ooh. willing to use my. I'm willing to die for my comedy. Now you know, most American comedians are not going. You know, they're willing to like sort of rewrite the pilot, but they may not be willing to die for what they believe in, and that's that's different stakes. You know, they're immediately. They're willing to get punched. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> right. Well, that's the great thing about it. Sasha was willing to get punched. I have to say, <laughs> and he did many times. Sasha Baron Cohen. Yes. you've pulled him out of some messy situations. I, I've grabbed weapons being, you know, uh, uh, pushed at us, and I've I've definitely jumped in a few times. Yes, I've you had know, to jump in a few times. Him and I did a risky thing recently. We went bowling at Eddie Murphy's house. Right. That would be <laughs> that 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 sent a shudder down my spine. That would be scary, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I left with the uh, ashtray I stole. It worked out great. <laughs> and a free pair of bowling shoes. I was going to ask you, does he have bowling shoes? How does that work? Do you go <laughs> there and switch out the he shoes? He does have bowling shoes, and he did let some other girls uh, bowl in their regular shoes and then immediately uh, cleaned up the scuff. He was uh, very attentive really? to his bowling alley. I was oh, wow. really impressed. That is nice. That it is really nice. nice yeah, to see. Yeah. He really truly you want bowl. somebody to maintain the bowling alley if they're going to have one. Yeah. You know, what's the point otherwise? And he had the music guys right. He was just a wonderful host. <laughs> With he the remind, lights kind he reminded of me of my dad. He reminded me of my dad when he was in the catering business. But Make sure everything looks good. Let me ask you something. Yes. You go to these places... The list is crazy, right? Mogadishu, Iraq, Saudi Arabia. You couldn't get into Syria. Right. Went to uh, uh, Liberia, Nigeria. Nigeria was scary. Yeah, Nigeria was scary. Do you have Do you have a family? Do you have Do you have a family? I have a I have a large large family. I am married now, and I have a stepson from my present marriage. And then I have four children from my previous marriage. And I have what? a grandchild, and they were all scared shitless. They and hate I, you for this? I freaked them out, and I really didn't mean to, but I think I, <laughs> I, I really... What do you mean you didn't mean to? I didn't realize how scared they were, and for some reason, I get scared with the idea of going to the airport, but I, I kind of calmed down, like in Mogadishu for some reason. I don't know why, but I freaked them out, and I scared them, and I really didn't intend to do that, but... That I, footage of you, people trying to rip you out of your car... Yeah. That <laughs> was uh, that was terrifying. That was a I bad. Like I was that was a bad moment. Like children of men. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My, that, that was in uh, <laughs> that was in Nigeria. That was in Lagos. Um, uh, my DP was so freaked out that he's going, look, look, they're coming into the car. And I'm like, pick up the camera, <laughs> start shooting. You know, that, that's how I am, man. I know I'm never going to be in this well, situation again. thank God again. you did. Exactly. I I know with Sasha that was one thing I learned. We're going to do this thing once. If it doesn't work out, we have to pack up and leave the city and do it somewhere else. So here, I'm in Mogadishu, I'm in Lagos. I'm not probably coming back, for, not for a long time. 
Shoot everything. Shoot everything. Even if we're going to be but killed, But when is the Mogadishu it. Comedy Festival? Wouldn't you go back for that? <laughs> well, it was at the... Uh, the I, was, I have a joke in the show about it being... A, the, you see this like, this rubble, and I say, that's the Mogadishu Improv. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, destroyed by an improvised device. You right. know, so... Uh, yeah, no, the stand-up, the, the comedy scene... I used to do a joke in Iraq. I said, <laughs> I met a girl from a broken home, literally. <laughs> right. There you go, exactly. No, in Somalia, they don't really do... There's not like stand-up venues because too many people have guns and they're shooting and you can't tell what side anybody's on. So it's mostly social media. Right. There's a state-run sort of TV, a lot of radio... Uh, that's where most of the comedy is done in Somalia. And there's been a number of comedians who were assassinated. I met, all the comedians I met who were alive right. have survived assassination attempts and torture and prison. But a couple of guys that they know, of course, uh, were assassinated for saying something. Who knows? Anti-government, anti-Al-Shabaab. No one's really sure because no one ever gets caught and there's no trial. Well, you could have there's just no... called some lady a cunt in the front row. Exa- it could have been that simple. And there's no infrastructure. There's no government there's no currency it's like chaos you know yeah so it's a little it's scary on that respect you realize there's no rules and your life and death means nothing you know really it wouldn't mean anything if if that if something was to happen so right you're not life... getting the new york times obituary exactly exactly have you guys stayed in touch with these people do you know what's I, happened to them i do stay in touch with, mo- with as many as i can yeah um, obviously the guys in the graveyard are going to be hard to get in touch they with. are very very hard to get in, t- in fact i try to stay in touch with the people in liberia but their whole social media uh, is kind of broken down, yeah. so I, it's very erratic. But the but the guys in Nigeria, I, I talk to, I talk to the guys in um, all through America, all the ladies of native comedy, and mm-hmm. all those people, the veterans. Uh, I try to stay in touch with as many people as I possibly can, I, yeah. both, and the Middle East guys too. Uh, 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 Ahmed Al Bashir, who has the Iraqi Daily Show, yeah. That guy who's like an amazing, inspiring character. That was the fellow who said he wants to be a martyr. He went, well, there's also the other guy who had the like the candid camera show with the terrorists yeah. and yes. the bombs. Yeah. He also, they're both ready to be martyrs. I mean, that's something they don't think twice about, you know? Because you're going to be, a, you're going to stand for something. You're, yeah, exactly. You're going to die for some bullshit cause or yeah. you're going to go, all right, well, I heard something about free speech or some idea of, of making people, like, you find some mission in what you're doing. Yeah, the mission is incredible. And that's what was the thing. your mission? My mission was to, was to bring these two worlds. First, I looked at the Trump world evolving, and I see America becoming a very isolated place. Uh-huh. And because I've done all this traveling, I know that we have a very distorted perception of what's going on in the rest of the world. And I thought, that, you know, comedy is something I know. It's a filter that I, as a, it's a metaphor for all of life to me. You know, I see so much through comedy. And I understand so much because of comedy that I thought I need to do. So, I can't just do another frivolous thing. I'm not doing anything frivolous. I'm not doing things for money. I want to do something that kind of counts, that maybe has some impact, that maybe moves people or changes people's minds or makes people think for a second. Uh-huh. And that's all my ideas and my thoughts the last few years have been focused on those sort of projects. Interesting. And this is one that I got made. You know how it is. Lots of things don't get made. So also. what was it? What was it? About this, what what did you say to yourself, and then what did you say to Netflix, saying, "Here's what I'm going to go out to do." Yeah, I I said that no one would do this, no one in their right mind would do this, you know. And I think that I'm uniquely qualified to bring these stories back. And I, I Netflix, I, I had the good fortune of the Russo brothers being fans of my work. Yeah, that was crazy. Yeah, that made a difference. I, I, You know, the Russo brothers were fans of my work. I met with them. We hit it off. Um, and <laughs> and I told them the idea, and they loved it. And so they were like, we got to make this. And we all went into Netflix together with, you know, a lot of that good, positive energy. And Netflix, being very cool about the whole thing from the very beginning, said yes. Who are the Russo brothers? The Russo brothers do the Avengers. They originally did Community. They were like yeah. sitcom showrunners. And they somehow morphed into like Captain America. They've become the biggest directors yeah. in the world. Yes, they are the Marvel directors. How is that helpful when you're trying to go to war zones? Well, it was helpful with Netflix to go, okay, these guys uh, have a foundation of success and they believe in him. And so maybe we'll do this, you know. They were willing to take Come maybe on. a risk. Come on. They probably thought Captain Marvel America was coming with you. You're the guy. That, you're the only, you are uniquely qualified to it's, do this. The be, part that trips me up is the family back home. Like, 
This is irresponsible, yeah. Larry. <laughs> you're, you're right, man. I, I this 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 is irresponsible. This yeah, I'm gonna have to play this for all the members of my family now because really <laughs> I don't have any defense for it. You're absolutely right. It was crazy in some ways, yet it was very exhilarating. I, I, I you know artistically. What you feel when you're on stage in that situation and the crowd is just throwing all that love at you and you're feeling that chemical reaction yeah. from the audience's yeah. response, that's what I feel when I do this. I feel that exhilaration, that tingling, that chemical change in me by experiencing these things and, and, and immersing in it. You know, I really... It's great. It, yeah. Yeah, it does. It, that's what I feel most... That makes me feel alive. You know, is there anybody out there alive tonight? <laughs> I think it's great that you brought these stories back and you Thank packaged you. them so so well. Thank you. It would have been a lot easier to send each of these comedians in these war zones two thousand dollars. You're so right. <laughs> That'll be you the second been, season. I'll just write checks. They'll just be close up been, my hand. You would have helped them. You would have helped them in a very similar way. It's so but true. The bigger message. I'm useless, is, really. When you is get that right you down. brought back. These four episodes, these stories you talk about gender, race, you talk about performing in hot spots around the world. And I do think it's really helpful for, let's call it the West, let's call it maybe the civilized world, because you, in fact, went to some very uncivilized environments. Yes. It's really helpful for us. And as a comedian who's in America, it is helpful, I think, for people to re be reminded that comedy is important, that we can't take our freedom of speech for granted. Yes. And when the president is going after Saturday Night Live and Kathy Griffin and, 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 and other people, that that's like the pinky of the fist. Totally. You know, we've had... That's the beginning we've of had the so, end. We've if had you keep so, letting that happen... Yes. We've had it so easy in America. We are a complacent country. We haven't had war on our, our soil since the Civil War. Mm -hmm. We don't know what that's like. People in these other countries, and I'm not even talking just about the countries I visited for this, but countries that I've done like Pringles commercials in, they, they want democracy, they crave democracy, and they are willing to fight and die for democracy. Huh. It's everything to them. Freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of everything is what they are seeking, and they are willing to die for it. Here we have it. So we don't feel that same sense of urgency about it. And so what happens is we allowed the country to get complacent so that Trump was, was suddenly able to sort of fill that void. And here we are in a very fragmented country with a lot of, this is a, a stand-up comedy observation also, because the country's fragmented. I feel like my view of stand-up is that has also fragmented to reflect the society. And so you have people that still find Louis C.K. hilariously funny, but they're not gonna laugh at Hannah Gatsby. And vice versa. So you have a lot of different islands of comedy, and maybe what happens as a result, and maybe what sort of happened in the 70s with Carlin and Pryor and those sort of icons was a sort of a synthesis of all those different voices that creates the next comic voice, whatever, whatever Johnny Rotten, yeah. Nirvana type of breakthrough thing that's going to be is out there that we can't imagine yet. You know. Well, this is, brings me to a, another good point that I wanted to ask you about. I do take some... You did give a lot of time to people I found, even I found, offensive. And I was like, well, you know, there's there's probably other comedians more virtuous, maybe even funnier. Mm -hmm. And I said to my cousin Ed here, I said, why do you think he gave this guy, this YouTube guy, who's just like running in a, a fast food place and throwing stuff on the floor and bothering people, <laughs> how is that dangerous comedy? Why is that even comedy? And why is that worth my time? Certainly Larry Charles's time. In, 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 in what's only a four-part documentary, and Ed made the good point of saying... Oh, yeah, that's your bread and butter. <laughs> <laughs> you like to wreak... You do yeah. wreak havoc in yes. your other films, yeah, yeah. And especially in Borat and, and Bruno... You know, you know, we we saw you yeah. doing that with Sasha. Well, one of the ways I get away with it <laughs> is that I'm I'm a white guy in a suit and tie, and that's something that Sasha taught me. By the way, mm -hmm. it's like it it gives me a lot of credibility and a little extra time in all these situations before people start calling the cops. But Boonk, the guy you're talking about. I found him fascinating because he's truly a transgressive comedian. He went to jail. 
He's he breaks the law. His comedy is about going in. It's not clever. It's not you know. It's not uh, witty. Mm -hmm. It's about breaking the law for a goof. And that to me is a, a funny equation, you know, or at least worth exploring as a funny equation. I guess. <laughs> There's much, another one like that too. Yeah, as much as I hated the guy, I gotta say when he stole that whole you know <laughs> yeah. unit out of the store. Yeah. That's funny. Or he steals. <laughs> he's, it's, it's the same shtick. He's got he's got a hook, you know. But it's really about him going to the doctors, the plastic surgeon, <laughs> and stealing the tit. You know, I mean, and he does it. And so I I thought, well, there's not this too guy many went to a plastic surgeon's office, asked to see a, uh, what do you call it? Silicone. A breast. silicon yeah. breast that would be implanted, an implant. I'm and, impressed uh, by how far he got every time. And he just went yes. the, and he just stole it and ran out the door. He catches people like unaware, and then they're like flat-footed. And he's gone already, you know. Mm. <laughs> but also, the thing that I found very interesting about him is he's a young black man in a society where young black men get shot for all kinds of non-illegal stuff. And here he is really breaking the law again and again and again, running away with stuff. And you know, he's risking death as by by cop shooting even to do these bits that you know his audience seems to love. So to me that at least he has stakes in what he's doing. He's willing to go to jail. The j jail helped him. It gave him credibility as he huh. talks about, you know. Yeah. So for him he needs that. What about the guy who you interviewed in front of the the veteran cemetery? B uh, Brace Belden. Piss Brace Pig. Belden I learned about Piss Pig Grandpa. Yeah. yeah. Um That's his comedy name. That's his uh, his Twitter feed name, I think. Now, I don't know if he's still using it actually cuz he got kicked off Twitter too. Yeah. But he's a guy that went you know, he was like a funny guy, a funny kind of Twitter guy who decided to fight for the Kurds, the Kurdish, the YPG in Iraq. So he's like a merc. He's a merc. Yeah. Exactly. And a kind of a self-deprecating, very Woody Allenish, nebishy Merck, yeah. exactly. And so I, I, I thought he made me laugh. I watched some of his videos from the front, you know, and I thought this guy is funny and the, the, the fighting is going on right on the other side of that door. And I thought that was cool and interesting. And I thought as a contrast to the veterans, excuse me, um, it would be interesting to talk to him. But I probably made a mistake in retrospect, in interviewing him of all the veterans right. at the Veterans Cemetery. And we yeah. did get kicked out. Because he's not a real veteran. He's, and not, then, he's not an official military, American military veteran. Yeah. Right. And I'm watching that episode, and I'm just laying in bed on a rainy Saturday, and I'm like, you know, you interviewed these amazing heroes who were blown apart and then do comedy, and then you interviewed this like jerk, right. and I'm like, oh, oh my, this is really like hard. You're back and forth. Where's he going from here? And then all of a sudden, I saw me <laughs> <laughs> right then. I'm after. Um, what's his name? Pig fart. <laughs> piss, well, if you want to be technical, it's piss pig granddad or piss pig grandpa. Brief and then you place. go right to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think I there was a you. quick stop with Bob Hope, and then you got to me. I needed you to center to center it. You know, you were the you were like the you were the the grab. <laughs> of the show, you brought it all together. All the different veteran experiences you've experienced, and so I thought that that was you were the perfect person to sort of sum up that experience. You know, I was very grateful to have you. I thought you did a great job. Also, I was honored to see you gave a lot of insights, man, into yourself and into what you do, and it was it was interesting to me, really fascinating. Thank you. Thank for that. you. You 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 interviewed me um, at the uh, Bob Hope USO uh, headquarters here in Los Angeles, where. Um, only a few minutes after you left that day, an entire busload of uh, army came in. Yeah, yeah. And Ed and I hung out for another hour. Oh wow, or so. wow, yeah. yeah. So we wouldn't build. We probably wouldn't be able to do the interview though, because they were walking right past the point that. Uh, oh yeah, no. You know, you sent some of them. They were there. They were had like eight hours to just sit around this USO, and then I remember you called them a big car. And you sent a bunch of them to the beach. Wow, you're great, like, you're, like you're ten minutes from the beach. You know, go why to the don't beach. you yeah, go to the beach? What are you doing here? You're a great guy. <laughs> you are a great guy. I mean, you prove it again and again and again. So that's that's very sweet, very sweet and generous of you. I get a dollar ahead of the from right. The guy. Of course, <laughs> your friend your friend runs the limo company. I know how. I know you get some vig from everything. So, but uh, I don't blame you. You have to make a living. Why? Why not? You know. Um, there's so much to unpack with this show, and we won't be able to go over all of it, but one of the scenes that jumps out um, is when you're in Liberia, and you talk to Liberian comedians, and they keep referencing how terrible the situation is uh, during the Ebola crisis, 
and how comedy was a way to bring some levity uh, in their lives. And these two women are talking about this criminal. Right. This criminal, um, Butt Naked. Yes. Is that his name? Yes, yeah. General Butt Naked. General Butt Naked. And, you know, it sounds like a joke, sounds like a goof, and then you see the guy and you see that it's real, and he was he would go into battle naked, and we see photos of that, and the guy was a real psychopath. This is in the <laughs> 70s, uh, 80s, No, the, 90s? this is the 80s and 90s, yeah. yeah. That, that war went on for a while, definitely the 90s. Yeah, not that long ago, 20 years ago, you know, 20 years ago, 20 plus maybe. And this guy, you asked him, he wasn't a comedian, so it was a little bit of a departure from what you yes. were doing, but he was indeed a veteran, I guess you could say, in that not the way we think of a veteran, but he was now reformed. A veteran and a survivor. He was he's both. You know, right. he's a very interesting guy because he's he probably committed more he public atrocities than virtually anybody else during that Liberian Civil War. Uh, responsible for so many people's families being destroyed, yeah. but found Christ after his last murder, and supposedly, and now is a successful preacher in the same Why village. Why isn't he in jail or dead? They had a Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission in Liberia, which was extremely, it's very corrupt, the government is very corrupt. The woman who is now the vice president is the uh, supposedly divorced wife of Charles Taylor, who's in The Hague for war crimes, General Butt Naked fought for Charles Taylor. So it's very possible that the government is still being run by Charles Taylor from The Hague. I mean, it's a very corrupt place, uh, and they do not have their shit together. And they've just lost, uh, they just had an election where the female uh, president, Ellen Sirleaf, who actually was a progressive kind of person there, she, she served her term and she couldn't run again. And now the country's kind of getting mired again in this kind of economic depression and corruption. It's it, over. T Africa is just filled, the governments are filled with corruption. Every country I went to, that is the main problem. They don't, even, they don't blame America. They're not angry at America. They're not bitter about America. They love America, actually. Right. They hate their governments because they think their governments have fucked the people, basically. And in each of these places, they have. It's true evil. True e evil, true evil, true uh, venal greed, you know, and nothing else, really, at the expense of very innocent people, you know, who are suffering and would be, have their suffering alleviated very easily by being treated fairly. Mm -hmm. Those generals, they all, in a weird way, I, I like to put it, they were kind of like comedians in their own right. They gave themselves all comical names. Yes. And they would, they would do, they would fight. In a funny way. Yes, they, they, he fought naked, but other other people fought in uh, in women's clothing. Uh, they had all kinds of names like General Mosquito, yeah. uh, General Bin Laden. They had like nom de guerres, you yeah. know. And that it was. And when I tell people, when people see the interview, they're they're thrown and it's shocking. It's true. But if I say to people, yeah, I talked to a guy named General Butt Naked, they laugh, you know. And that's the weird juxtaposition. This is a dark thing that's also weirdly somehow funny to us as well that we don't like to admit might be also humorous at the same time that it's horrible. Mm -hmm. What were you, what was, were you nervous? I was definitely, we had just gotten to Liberia and we were told that he would talk to us that night that we got there. You had a fixer down there. We had a fixer, a cool guy, and he took us down to the streets of uh, Monrovia, which were dark, there's not much electricity, and he met us there in front of the place where many of the battles took place on that street. I mean, it's a small place, What's Monrovia. in it for him? to talk to you, this former warlord, this killer? Um, I think that there's probably a couple, First of all, never diminish the importance of ego and vanity. Right. So this is somebody who has always courted attention. You know, uh, I, I learned about him by seeing other people had talked to him many years before, and it stuck in my head. You know, so he has a consciousness of his image that he's trying to cultivate in one way as a, as a kind of a notorious figure. People want to hear about that part, but he's also trying to lay the groundwork for his future in Liberia as a preacher. You know, so he's, he wants to cash in and also rehabilitate his image at the same time. He thinks he's going to be remembered as a saint. Exactly. That's that's he, because he reformed. Because he reformed. Exactly. I believe in reform as much as much as anyone. Probably more than most people. But you know, certain people. I mean, it's there's hard. no reform. Have it, you had yeah. backlash? 
Has anyone gotten mad? At, yes. Oh, well, either even, over there even, or over here. Even the two women, the two women that we talked to, of who course, two, they both say we would kill him if we had a chance. You know, they people want to murder mm. him, but I right now in Liberia. It's actually a very mellow place right now, and so the violence, the violence was so out of control during the Civil War that people, it's like it's, people are just recovering from that, and so there's not a lot of violence going on right now. It's a lot of recovering from violence, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's very complicated, and the fact that you didn't ask too many questions and just saw people for who they were in the exactly. moment is really an interesting skill. I interviewed a coyote a guy who brings a human trafficker who brings people over the Mexican border. Yeah. In my border roast on Comedy Central and I remember coming back with the footage and a couple people on my producing team were like you were too easy on him. And I go I wasn't there as a judge. I right. was there to understand what makes somebody want to do that and to teach people back home how it all works. You have to realize what my mission was. Yes. I am not the guy in charge of this, uh, yeah, of and this why issue. Should, you're not a, I don't think you or I are responsible for that for that at all. I agree with you. I don't think we. it's up to us to impose meaning on what we are observing. Right. That's for the audience to do. And people are going to take away different things from that. Some people are going to find it funny or entertaining, and some people are going to be offended by it. And we can't impose meaning on it. When we, when someone writes a poem, they don't tell you what the poem means. It's up to you to figure out what the poem means or what the painting means. And I think the same thing is true here. You, what you take away from it as an audience member is, in my opinion, completely up to you. You know, and it's valid. If you felt that, then that's valid. You know, and I respect that that feeling, even if I don't agree with it. You, know? you held your you you held it together, and I was I was I was really blown away by that part of the movie. You know what? Let's 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 listen to it for a second. Sure. Um, I, I have a couple of, 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 of questions. If you're not comfortable with them, don't answer them, okay? You can be totally honest about that, okay? But I'm kind of curious. Like, I've read that you've eaten human flesh, okay? What does it taste like? Some parts taste like, like uh, the pork ribs. A human yeah. is closer to a pork. Right. And would you, would you, would you cook it? Would you like? How did? How did? How did you eat it? How was it eaten? Yes, yeah, certain parts, like the heart, for ritual purpose, you don't cook it. So the heart you would eat raw. Yeah. Okay. But other parts, you have to cook it because it's strong. Right. Wow, dude. <laughs> and and your security is. I had a most amazing security guy. You brought him with you, or you brought picked him, up people him over there? One guy? One guy, one guy, I mean, he would, you know, he would get some Iraqi ex-soldiers, or, you know, he always put together a little crew for us. But I had one guy, because I was like, you know, usually Sasha in the movies, he's the, uh, the, uh, the irreplaceable asset. Right. So mm -hmm. he is the one that has to get in short. Like, I could be killed on a Sasha movie, I could be replaced. Right. But you can't replace Sasha. On this thing, I, I put my name in it. So they couldn't re really replace me. <laughs> so I had this. I had a security guy with me who was an English ex English soldier. He's still English. He's an ex soldier. Um, very very cool guy. And he was great. But when we got to Somalia, we got to Mogadishu. We had to take. By the way, before we left, we had to take security. I don't know if you had to do this. Like all the all the emergency medical stuff, mm -hmm. security measures. You know, I, I had to get like six vaccinations. It's a lot of work. Well, I have a deathly peanut allergy. I had to be very. There you careful. go. You got to be careful about that. And that is I have very my prevalent. Pen, my herp, what's it called? Herpy pen, hypey pen. Yes, yes, yes. Exactly, exactly. No, so, man, you got major balls, bro. Yeah, major yeah. balls. Also, it's not your duty to tell these guys off. You're the, exactly. you're you're compiling the information and you're bringing it back. Well, you know, also, if you're telling them off, they're gonna kill you. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, real, first of all, I didn't have really that, I didn't want to tell them off. I really wanted them to feel comfortable enough to spew. You know, if I started yeah. going, well, what about this? If I started of challenging course. them, it would shut down the conversation. And yeah. my job was this to This is really why I understand when Donald, like, the, the liberals love to go after the president here because he won't, he won't condemn the assassination of the journalist Khashoggi, or he will ignore... Uh, the 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 
the, the, some of the brutality that happened in North Korea when they sent the student back. And I go, yeah, he's not a diplomat. He's a businessman. He's using what, what he can, the leverage. What this guy, Kim, needs is for us to talk to him. Right. So if well, you I talk to him that. as a businessman I, yeah. and not as a diplomat, you're going to get somewhere. The only problem with that with him, in my opinion, is that he also has like an agenda, like with all these countries. He wants... He's also looking to, you know, fulfill some kind of business agenda as well. You think they have golf in North Korea? Well, they they will <laughs> if he has his way. You know, that's he wants to, you know, yeah. blur that line. And they I shot understand. nine holes and four journalists. There you go. <laughs> 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 exactly. So that's the situation. Yes. Oh, Do you man. think there's comedy in North Korea? There's definitely. First of all, I would recommend an, a movie uh, um, if you're looking for a movie to watch. It's called Inside the Red Chapel. Mm-hmm. It's by a Danish guy named Mads Bruger, and he takes two. Get ready for this. Two Korean Danish comedians, and he kind of fakes a goodwill tour of North Korea with these two Danish Korean comedians. They're Korean. Huh. Of, they're Danish of Korean descent. Wow. And he got into North Korea under this pretense and then shot all kinds of cool stuff there. And yes, there is some kind of comedy scene there. You know, again, talk about a, repress, a repressive environment. I don't know what the material is about, but they definitely have entertainment there. Mm-hmm. They have TV, they have live shows, all that stuff is going on there, but it's, it's very prescribed. There's a place where content, you know, is very, very controlled. Yeah. yeah. How much do you think American comedy is influencing foreign countries' comedy. Do you think Netflix being global and the the internet, obviously, uh, dripping into all these other places? Because I'll, uh, in a broad level, I was amazed. I went on tour last year with Chris Rock mm-hmm. as his support act. as a surprise. So I'd walk out, do 20 minutes, bring up volunteers from the audience, roast them. And when they would talk to me in in Sweden, in Dublin even. We did a bunch of shows in England. We did show in Tel Aviv. We did shows in Stockholm. Um, Israel. And, and, and they understood everything I said. But Definitely. when they talked to me, I don't understand a lot of what right. they said. They're, they're way ahead of us in that respect. They And I think it's because of Seinfeld, uh, uh, Friends... Um, Chris Rock and Eddie Murphy. Yes, they learned English and they learned the accent. They learned English, but they also learned comedy. And that what I learned ver- very quickly for, on my trip was, regardless of where else, what are the streams go into the modern comedy scene in these countries? Western comedy is the foundation for all of it. Love that. From Eddie Murphy Love to Jerry that. Seinfeld, Western comedy is people model themselves just like we modeled ourselves on the comedians that preceded us and the comedy stars and those people that preceded us, that's what people in these other countries are doing. But they don't have precedence in their own country, so they're turning to the United States, sometimes to Britain also, uh, to find uh, comedy role models. And that's where most of them are being drawn from. And so you see a lot of uh, comedians who are derivative of, like I said, Seinfeld or Chris Rock, you know, or Dave Chappelle. Those comedians are, you, you hear echoes of their work in the young comedians in these other countries. Why didn't you go to Russia? I want to go to Russia. We had a budget and a schedule. If I was to do this again, I would go to Russia, I would go to Ukraine, I would go to Venezuela, I would go to Yemen. There's you know, a comedy club in Moscow. Oh, definitely. And, and they send me uh, pictures sometimes. They do battles there, and there's a mural wow. of me on the wall. That's so cool. And, I, and, I, and it's one of my proudest things that I'm that that they're seeing what we're doing yes over there yes and it has a big influence I mean they even had a Saturday Night Live type of show for a while I don't know if it's still on but they had a satirical news show for a while huh. in in Moscow so it does happen you know it's very interesting to see that what's allowed sometimes like the they the uh, countries are very oppressive but they allow a certain amount of subversion in the comedy to sort of relax the tension in the country, really. I think here's what's happening in Russia. And I was there as a young man. I, I was there in college. And I got to talk to Refuseniks. And I also was there as a tourist, basically, with my political science teacher. I think that he, Putin, has, and that, that administration, if you will, has such a hold that they're so confident 
that they just find it amusing. Yeah. It's it, it's how Trump used to be when I first started roasting Trump and working at his clubs and stuff. Right. He had a great sense of humor. Right. You know, he had such a hold on it all. You could say anything to him. His empire was secure. Yes. We could talk about the house of cards and his and, and his his bankruptcies and all that. That would be the one sensitive thing, but he didn't stop us. Right, right, he right. He didn't stop me as an entertainer. And, and, and he also he brought me right to it. Yeah. He brought me to Mar a Largo. Let me have it. <laughs> he introduced me himself and sits in the front row. He yeah. liked the attention. I think because and now that he's in position of more power, obviously, a leader of the free world maybe, uh, maybe we Maybe Putin is, but but right. but, but, but but more likely, I it, think. I <laughs> think he point. he's he's less confident in his position, and yeah. that's why he's lashing out at the comics. He's not the audience anymore. Now he's the comedian. You see, he always wanted to be a comedian. He wanted to be funny. He is funny. But I think that in the position that he's in now. It's like the the audience is not you know the he he roast battled his way into the Oval Office exactly but people don't <laughs> they know when you're up there they know your context they know that you're joking but when he's the president people just don't know he's joking and a lot of stuff he says I could tell and I constantly tell people he's he's not serious he's just joking right now right it's a bad joke and people take it literally and things happen as a consequence of that you know but he doesn't do anything to offset it either you know right it's like he's not well, he doesn't apologize he doesn't for the sing joke. I'm a nice guy like Don Rickles did. <laughs> At the end of the act, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that might help him. He, Don I'm is, a nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> that was important. I'm a nice guy. I remember Separate hearing that the, the first time. Remember that the first time you heard that? You go, Don, why is Don Rickles singing that? <laughs> it didn't even make any sense to me. Family Guy has got to do a Don Rickles, Donald Trump mashup episode. Where <laughs> he does the Rickleisms in yes, his act. Yeah, he loves it. Yeah. <laughs> He does, a lot of his humor is very Rickles like. It's from that era. And of course, that doesn't. Lion play Ted the Cruz. Same way. Is he coming at me? Is he coming at yeah, me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. Miami, Yam, Miami, Miami. You know, you had the, my wife sitting there with the, with the jewels, you know. <laughs> you know you had this, I miss Don Rickles. Oh, my God. Me too. Me too. I played my father, who's in assisted care, as I was telling you. I played. Your I, father's 92 years 92 old. 92 years old. I sat with him. I wanted to sort of bring him out of his funk a little bit. So I showed him on my phone. I showed him Jackie Mason from the Ed Sullivan shows, you know, the black yeah. and white show. And I mean, it would still make you double over in laughter. It's so inappropriate now also. Yeah. But it's hilarious. And my father actually was able to sort of enjoy it and remember it and kind of laugh at it, which was really cool. My first time really laughing at a comic that I can remember was Jackie Mason's one-man show. Before I was, maybe I was an open mic or my Aunt Bess took me. <laughs> and it hit her so hard she was laughing at the setups. Like she knew what was coming. <laughs> oh my God! Well, you know Jackie Mason. Th this is a whole other world of comedy. But one of the things I love about Jackie Mason is that he would he would kind of hook you in with something, and then it didn't even have to be words anymore. He would do impressions like I was showing my father like his Ed Sullivan impression. <laughs> There's not even any word. He's he's just doing this. There's and he's no spin impression. Yeah. He's spinning around. <laughs> yeah, he's just boom, but he's doing that stuff. And for like five minutes, and the it just builds and builds and builds. Larry you know? David, big shot. You come to my house. <laughs> you, you talk about Mogadishu. <laughs> I'm talking to you, Mister. You, yeah. Mister Big Shot. <laughs> Uh, you know what? I got to pee real quick, and then okay. we're in the home stretch. I promise. All right, very good. I'm gonna pee real quick. I drank so much coffee. This is uh, really, really. Fun. This is unbelievable. Oh, good. I hope it's working out for you. Anything that I missed, I'll, I'll do it. Not at all. I'm. Whatever happens, happens. I don't have to. I we're promoting the show just by me thing. being here. I'm good, actually. Still, we're good. I don't think we need to hit the touchy subjects. By the way, we're already at an hour. Okay. Yeah. Whatever you want. The um, yeah, we didn't really get to the. The the sex and uh, the gender and the uh, right and the right, race right. episodes so a little stuff bit to talk about yeah it's just it's so the, the, the other stuff just Listen, so interesting if you are stuck and you need me to come back at some point because you don't have a good guest I I'll come back and talk more about it you know? man I would yeah. love that because yeah. I feel like we only scratched the surface I here would, listen man I'm I love the, this. Was my favorite format of anything I've ever done. Yeah, you know, I was telling Jeff about the uh, the doing the view and how nerve wracking it is. Mm -hmm. I, this is what I would be. I'd be doing this without the microphones. Yeah, yeah. You know, I sit around with my friends or whoever, I'll and be passing bullshit. a giant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's it's fine. You know, I I'm happy to do it. I'd be happy to come back. It's we, been a very cool experience. When we were in uh, Africa in Soweto, we 
decided we were that's when we were filming the cop special. Yeah. And so we're like, all right, we're gonna interview some Sowetan police officers. Yeah. None of them would talk to us. Yeah. Except for like one guy who was like reserve. Did you have a guy setting things up for you also, Jim? A, a fixer? little a little we had our, our guards. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. It's a, he's all right now. He ain't gonna go to sleep in these last ten minutes. <laughs> yeah, we, we had a yeah, we met this one guy he had a like a cloth badge that he like safety pinned yeah. to his shirt. And it was just like barely wearing clothes. It was just dripping yeah. off of him and just Well like, in Somalia what you had in Mogadishu constantly was there were checkpoints. Every street has a lot of checkpoints, a lot of soldiers. Mm-hmm. And you would reach a checkpoint and suddenly people jump out and there's seventeen guys in camo with AKs, but they're different color camo. There's a brown camo, there's a green camo, there's a blue camo. Yeah. It's like well, who's who? You don't know who's who. It's really, that is a very freaky experience. When yeah, there's no you're uniform. surrounded, and they're really all possibly going to start shooting at each other, and you're in the middle, you know? I was going to tell you a story, in fact, Jeff, if I may, about the security. Yeah. That when we got to Mogadishu, I had a great security guard. He was an amazing guy. Uh-huh. Really, really bonded with him. But when we got to Mogadishu, we had a security meeting, and he said, uh, he said in his English accent, you know, if anything, if anything happens, if shooting breaks out or a bomb goes off, you just follow me. And I was like, all right, hold it. Hold it right there. If, a sh- if the shooting starts or a bomb goes off, you guys run. You run in any direct. You got to just go run and hide. What if he gets his head blown off? Are you going to follow him? Right. If he's laying there <laughs> in, a, in a bloody pool with no head, you um, are going to run. And r- I'm not going back to the United States and telling your wives and girlfriends and kids that you were killed on my watch. I just am not permitting it. We have to get lucky for three days. And a lot of this trip is about being lucky. Yeah. You know, and a lot of my life really, documentary making is about being yeah, lucky. Yeah, and a lot of my life is about being lucky. And so that's a theme that runs through everything I do also. How so? Well, I feel like I, I'm fortunate to be a, a white person born in the nineteen fifties. I'm here, born, here. I'm born in the uh, the golden triangle of Jewish comedy in the Brooklyn. Jamaica. <laughs> yeah, the Jamaica of Jewish comedy, man. <laughs> Mel Brooks, you know, Larry David, so many classic guys come out of that neighborhood. And I was just exposed to it, you know? So it was a natural outgrowth of what I was interested in. So I was lucky that way. I was lucky that I didn't know any better than to stand in front of the comedy store and try, you know, handwrite jokes. Is that jokes. true? Yeah. I, I, you told me this. Yeah. You would, you would write jokes. Yes. Not necessarily know who they'd be for. No. They you were just, just wrote funny, funny jokes. one-liners. Yes. And jokes that stand- I sometimes tried out. As a stand-up, and realized, you know what? I'm not the funniest person. I'm not. But no one knows they're not. Well, but, that's right. When I was when I was 18 years old, I probably prematurely judged myself as not being ready, and I needed money. I was a parking valet, so I said, I could. I bet I could sell. And that's. I knew Woody Allen, who was from that same neighborhood, born on the same day. We have the same birthday. Is that true. Yes, December 1st. He had started off selling jokes, and I thought that's something that I could possibly do. I'll just write the jokes. I'll stand in front of the comedy store like selling loose joints at Madison Square Garden, which I did also during rock concerts. I'll just sell loose jokes, you know? And I started selling loose jokes, and guys started buying them. You did know, you like, roll your jokes up, too, like a joint? <laughs> well, you know, they were, they were handwritten on legal pads because there was no computers, and I still don't use a computer anyway, but they were all handwritten jokes. So you can imagine reading a handwritten joke today. you think the guy was out of his mind. But I didn't know any better, and mm-hmm. I didn't know how to get in. You don't use you a know? computer? I don't, not for composing. I usually just write, uh, uh, yeah, no, I don't. Uh, How about a razor or a comb? You ever try one of those? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I am in a, a very Luddite, I'm a Luddite, you know. Me and Ted Kaczynski have a very similar approach to technology. <laughs> if the Unabomber was a movie director. I wrote, by the way, I wrote to the Unabomber. I oh. wrote to Ted Kaczynski and said, you know, I think people have a very. He loves mail. Yeah, he, and he loves comedy. <laughs> and, and, but, but and I, he wrote back saying, I, I don't like, your handwriting is too hard to he, understand. Yeah, you're right. Could you, could you just said that on a computer. Why did you, you write it? I want. I thought because I wanted to talk to people like him also, mm-hmm. you know, about comedy and about their childhoods and that they find. Because you think of Ted Kaczynski being the most humorless person in the world, uh-huh. and you think, well, Jesus, did he ever laugh at anything? Was there ever a moment of levity or lightness sure. in his life? And I was very curious. I wrote him a letter. I said, people only know you as the Unabomber. You know, they don't know the Ted. From before, you know, from your childhood. And wouldn't it be interesting to talk about that? And I, you know, I'm not here to make any judgments about you. You're doing your time and, you know, nothing's going to change that. But if you ever wanted to talk, I would love to, I have a camera crew, I'll come and I'll talk to you. And I didn't hear from him. 
Uh, mm. But I stopped checking my mailbox also because I. <laughs> <laughs> he, he blows stuff up. Yes, that's it's right. the assistant's yeah. job now. Wow! I wrote wow. to Carlos wow. the Jackal. I wrote to I, I wrote to a number of people. Um, maybe with the second season they'll be more open to it. You know. How long yeah. did this movie take you to make? Well, it, it t- I, I probably shot for about two months in the two different continents, like Africa. And you Middle stayed East. over there. You came back. We, we came back between the two. Be- after Middle East, we came back. And then we went to Africa and came back. And then I did the United States. I did a couple of weeks in the United States also. Right. The Ladies of Native Comedy and Rick Shapiro I talked to, who's not in the show right now, but I have a great interview, really long interview with Rick Shapiro. I have a long interview yeah. with John Waters oh, that I man. haven't been able to use. So I have a few other things like that that I haven't been able to use. I yet. really love what you did with Miss Pat. Oh, I, man. I, I'm a big love fan Ms. of Pat. hers. Me too, me too. And known her a while. And yeah. she talks about... Growing up in a rough childhood. Yeah, and she is honest in that kind of guileless way. I mean, she tells it like it is, and she's just super, super funny about it, you know? Horrible, horrible events that are hilarious. I, I, I you, you know, you mentioned earlier that your life's a series of accidents. I call them happy accidents. I never would have been a comedian if... I think that I never would have been a comedian if my parents didn't die when I was a teenager. Isn't that fascinating? That's the black swan of your parents' death is that you're here today. Isn't that crazy? And I think these things happen. Sometimes you realize it and sometimes you don't. You know, I grew up in a shitty place in Newark, New Jersey, where kids like me, white kids, chubby kids got picked on. Sure. My mom dragged me against my will to karate school. Right. And, you know, I got all the way up to black belt. And then that gave me the confidence to talk smack later right. in life. Wow. To be an insult comic. Not just a comic, but right. somebody who, like, goes at people. And I'm a big believer in happy accidents. Yeah. Well, you can only recognize these paths in retrospect also. Right. You almost you can't see it going forward. You're kind of going forward by instinct, you know, and and kind of figuring it out. I mean, I grew up in Trump Village. Right. Which, you know, they talk today in, in the modern society, we talk about bullying and stuff. Well, every other kid where I grew up was a bully. You know, it was like you're either a bully or being bullied. Those are the two kind of choices. And I happened to be good at sports and I was tall and I was able to avoid a lot of that stuff. But I learned as you did from your from the horrors of your life you learned who you were to some degree. And for me also, talking my way out of things to avoid getting my ass kicked, talking people into things, I got very good at that as, as a street person. And of course, as an adult, it's a terrible, those are terrible characteristics. But as a director of Borat... Unless they're trying to rip you out of, a, out of your car on a shoot in <laughs> exactly, Mogadishu. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> right, right, exactly. I thought that I'd be able to get out of that with my words also. See, this is interesting because this is really what this podcast is about which is having thick skin, using comedy to get through life, being able to take a joke. And I really think that that's what your film, your four-part documentary, The Dangerous World of Comedy on Netflix is about. It's bringing some attention to that, but more importantly, it's funny. It's a funny thing to watch. You know, Thank you, you. you drop in movie clips and, and, and your, your presence and your narration is is at times hilarious and at times it's heartbreaking. I always like that kind of stuff. I'm thank proud you, to be a very, very small part of it. Um, thank you, Larry Charles. Um, thank you, Jeff. We do our podcast. We always pay tribute to somebody that we lost. It's part of getting through life. Uh, it's time for Roast in Peace. <laughs> This is a tough one today. Is it? I think so. He seemed like a very nice guy. Everyone loved this guy. Luke Perry passed away today due to complications from a stroke at the age of 52. Obviously, he was in 90210. He was in the new show Riverdale. He played Archie's father. Uh, he He's was... the last person to pretend to care about Shannon Doherty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Today is, a bad day. Today is a bad day for TV fans and a great day for all the horny women in heaven. <laughs> he was hot. He was hot. He was hot, yeah. Did you ever meet him? I never met him. 
But I'm, but I'm sure I would have thought it was hot in person. <laughs> this heart throbs heart is no longer throbbing. <laughs> Luke Perry had great versatility as an actor. He could play a hot bad boy or a hot good boy or a hot bull rider or a hot dad or... You get the picture. <laughs> Luke Perry was such a good actor, he made it look like Jason Priestley could actually throw a punch. <laughs> Fun and, fact, yes. And Tori Spelling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fun fact, uh, Luke Perry's first job was in a doorknob factory. Too bad it didn't help him turn into a good actor. <laughs> you would have thought. You would have thought. <laughs> yeah. Growing up, Luke worked for a doorknob factory. That's true. It was there that he found the inspiration for his acting style. <laughs> <laughs> Luke Perry also played a rodeo rider in a film called Eight Seconds. Unfortunately for us, the movie was much longer than that. <laughs> you could see that one coming from Mogadishu, couldn't yes. you? <laughs> I, I, think, I think they're going to be using that tomorrow in Mogadishu. <laughs> Luke Perry moved to L.A. shortly after high school to pursue acting when he should have pursued acting lessons. <laughs> Most recently, Luke played Archie's father in Riverdale. Riverdale is the sexy version of the Archie comics. Luke Perry was perfect for the role because he, he always was a great two-dimensional actor. <laughs> oh, jeez. Roast in peace, Luke Perry, 90210. Oh, no. <laughs> Goodbye, Luke. That's great. That's really therapeutic. I feel better. Yeah, I good. feel better already. Um, I can't believe I didn't mention earlier that I'm going to be at Levity Live in Oxnard this weekend, March 29th and 30th at the Brea Improv. You ever go to these comedy clubs? No. Just for fun. <laughs> I it's haven't a been to a comedy club since I sold jokes. Probably. I. I. I yeah, it's torturous, I think. When's the last time you walked into the comedy store? A, a while ago. I can't remember the last time, actually. I think Jimmy Walker was throwing something at somebody. So I'm <laughs> There's a real resurgence happening there now. I think you'd get a kick yeah, out of it. Yeah, you know, I've been to the Billy Room. I've seen. I've gone to see people showcasing there a few times over the years, but I haven't been there recently. I used to spend a lot of time there, for God's sakes. Yeah. You know, so I was there a lot, and at the improv too. And Joe Rivers had a had a uh, a thing in Beverly Hills. Do you remember that? Yeah, that she little, had a little yeah. spot that she. I worked sold out jokes at. to her too. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Ten dollars. It was all ten dollars. Do you remember one, one joke, joke you sold? I sold a joke to Jay Leno. I, I oh. had a joke about. You know, everybody's, you know, two, I was a child actor. I played the embryo in 2001. You know, I had, I had, you know, I had some funny jokes like that. You know? So that was one that I sold. But, you know, in the comedy store, there's that window. And Jay or somebody would take the joke. They go, if it, go, if it gets a good response, I'll give you the 10 bucks. It was a contingency, right? And I'd watch them on stage, and I could tell they were doing the joke, getting a laugh, and I made 10 bucks. So that was like, I, was, I had so much riding on that one joke. A lot, a lot going for it, you know. But one of those guys wound up getting a TV series, and that was Fridays, and I met Larry David there. Huh. Ah. So again, happy accidents. happy accidents, man. Luck. Yeah, I hitchhiked to that interview. I mean, you, you were, were working prepared. your ass off. I was. I oh, listen. When I went to that interview, I already had sketches that they had seen in light, and I wrote a whole new bunch of sketches to bring to the interview. To impress them, to blow them away. Wow! And Jack Burns was one of the producers. Took this one of the sketches. He used to like to read sketches out loud, and he started reading it. And I actually had the audacity to go, "Wait, stop! You're ruining the sketch. You're not reading it right. Let me wow. do it." And I read the sketch. The director. Uh, yeah, and I was very arrogant about it, and I kind of had a. I didn't care really in some way, and that was like liberating. And at the end of the interview, I actually said, and this is the, a God's honest truth. I said, "Look." I don't care if I get this job or not, but don't dick me around. Like, call me up. Don't make me wait. Just tell me I don't have it. I can live with that. I can respect that. But don't make me sit around and waiting for what, what might happen. Huh. And I got home. I hitchhiked back on Hollywood Boulevard from Prospect Avenue to we were living on Cherokee. We were roommates, actually. Oh, your buddy. My friend Richard and I were roommates. And I got I back. I thought he was the, your bodyguard this whole time. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be here if that was the case. Um, <laughs> And the phone was ringing, and it was Jack Burns. He's like, I, I have good news and bad news. The good news is I'm getting back to you. And my heart sunk, you know? And then the bad news is you're hired. And so it was that, oh. you know, like a, like such a storybook kind wow. of story. Wow, hired you, know? you with a joke. 
He hired me with a joke. <laughs> Did you sell him that joke? <laughs> <laughs> I just used it here, right? It worked wow, again. Wow, that's a works. $12 joke <laughs> easily. Absolutely, I know. I needed a bonus. I did. So, yeah, I went from being a parking valet to being a TV writer, literally. You know, So I, I see myself as a very lucky person. You know, it's interesting. Like There is luck involved, and I'm a believer in happy accidents, as we keep saying, but nothing you're saying to me sounds like luck. <laughs> it sounds like you went, wrote the joke, stood in front of the club, you did the work. Yes, you got to so do I the work. So I think you're selling it short by saying there's luck. That'd be like saying that those women in Saudi Arabia are lucky that they're not allowed to drive so that they could have these jokes. Yes. Or, or they're lucky that the, the, the one comedian in, in Liberia was killed so that these two could tell the story and, and there's more slots open. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. But I, I remember... You're dismissing what When Woody work. Allen was Woody Allen in the, in the late 60s and early 70s, he, did a, he had a cover story about him on Time magazine. Yeah. And I remember, and again, like I said, he's from the neighborhood, same birthday, so I, he was my, my idol. And I remember him saying, you know... The, the, uh, the talents I have are valuable in this marketplace today. You know, people want jokes. They want, but if I lived in the 1880s, you know, in the, in the plains, you know, I was brought up in an Indian tribe, I would have been murdered by now, you know? <laughs> so it really depends on a lot of circumstances being in your favor. Yes, you have to make the most of it, and you have to be disciplined and work hard. That's crucial. But not everybody who works hard is good. And not everybody who works hard syncs up with the marketplace, you know? And some people work hard and are terrible. So there's a lot of factors that you can't control, a lot of variables. And that's why I talk about luck. I'm, uh, I also try to be very humble and modest uh, about everything that happens. I right. try not to, I don't believe that we control all that much, but we control a little bit and we need to exert control over those things, mm. you know? You're a good soul. I can see that. You too, man. Your family is lucky to have you back. Thank you. Thank you. Because Tell them that. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I mean, you really got. I mean, you're really. They're like, when are you going to Venezuela? You know, now they're waiting for me. To go. <laughs> what else? Um, all right, so um, we got all of Jeff states. I think you undersell them sometimes on the show. I don't feel like people really understand what you do at these shows. You bring your favorite comics. And you roast the audience, yeah. And not like in a bully way. You don't like you know mess with the people and you know. I mean, you, you might talk to a couple people in the front row, but you know you call up a bunch of volunteers. They come on stage and you line them up, and you have a skill that no one else has. And you just drill each one of them right down the line, and it is an experience that they'll like tell for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Mm. And it is like and it is a crazy time. And it's a, and you'll and they'll you see your family members do it and you just see the people uh where you're from doing it. Yeah. And you're also going to these towns and you're roasting each one of these towns. Right. You're gonna roast Oxnard, whatever never, that's gonna be. I never <laughs> even know? heard of Oxnard <laughs> until I got the gig. No, you're providing a one of a kind thing and you're the historical precedent. When I think of you and I think about what you're saying, which I completely agree with, yeah. you manage to do these roasts. There's no anger, there's no bitter, there's sweetness and mm -hmm. generosity, and yet they're roasts. You've managed to find that sort of equation between those two seemingly disparate things, which is really a, a skill that you have that Jackie Leonard didn't have, that Don Rickles didn't have, that, that George Jessel, the, the original Toastmaster General, none of those guys had that. They were edgy angry people now you have edge and you have your anger but when i've seen you do these roasts in all these different environments mm -hmm. there's a generosity and a sweetness and a, con a connectivity to the people that you're roasting you're not standing up on a pedestal just talking down to them you're no. connecting with them and that's a you're making it a beautiful you're making the roast ironically you make the roast a beautiful experience huh. you know that's very cool you Thank always you. say you want people to go home happy and get laid that's, that's true. <laughs> right. I like being the wingman. Yeah, that's good. That's good. You're the nation's wingman. Yeah. High praise from uh, the uh, Broadway Danny Rose of Mogadishu. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you should do next. Proud you should start an agency for all these oppressed <laughs> oh, yeah. comedians. Well, I wanted, I've, I've suggested to Netflix in all seriousness that we get some of the comedians from around the world mm -hmm. 
and do it. A lot of them speak English yeah. and do a tour or do a tour in other places and bring the American comedians there. You know, people would be so excited to see American comedians in places like Nigeria. Right. They would go crazy. Well, and now Brasca Mouth tours America. He's Brasca in Texas this week. Exactly. He's you a know, very big comedian. We yeah. saw a lot of these people when we were in Johannesburg. Nigerian yeah. comedians would come to other parts of Africa, and we got to see that, and they speak English, they perform in English. Yes, yes. Nigeria is one of the few countries that has a fully developed comedy scene, like movies, TV yeah. shows, stand-up. That's actually the comedians in, in Nigeria are amongst the most successful people in the society. Why do you think that that, that country comedy kind of rose? I think that... Uh, um, there's a lot of reasons. I think it you has spent a to, lot of time in the movie talking yeah, about that. Yeah, Western, Western, Western Africa is much more influenced by the European colonies and by America, and the the comedy tradition in Nigeria was richer going in. There was a lot of comedy in Nigeria, but not stand up, but a long tradition of humor in, in Nigeria, in all forms and all mediums, plays, books. You know, as well as television and movies. So, and Nollywood really kind of became like its own industry, a movie huh. industry. Wow. And they w were shooting cheap movies the way comedies were shot, like in the silent film era, you know. And out of that, guys started to, there started to be a craving, a need. And there was one comedian named Alibaba who, um, he was the first comedian to market himself. And he bought a billboard in Lagos said, you know, uh, comedy is hard, whatever he said, yeah. with his phone number, and he started getting that bookings. That was so cool. Yeah, and then he started to bring on the other comedians. And they all used, you know, like, you go to their houses, they have joke books, like stacks of joke books, and they've seen all of Chris Rock stuff and all of Dave Chappelle stuff and all of those things, and they are encyclopedic in their knowledge of American comedy. Huh. So and Very they, cool. They found out how to parlay it. It's like our greatest export. Comedy. Exactly, exactly. I used to think that Canada, that was their greatest export. They would send sketch groups and comedy here and Right, Second you know, City. And Lorne Michaels and the whole thing. And and, and and now it really has become North America is feeding the world the laughs they need. Yes. That's the key thing, also the laughs they need. I, they need these people need these laughs. They are crucial to their survival, to their existence. And so they aren't just laughs that evaporate into the into the air. They're laughs that resonate and stick with people and change people's minds about things. You're gonna get. A, you're gonna be hearing people's stories for the rest of your life now. The people in your movie are gonna. They're gonna grow. They're gonna die. They're gonna. You know. You really like. It's gonna. It's gonna be around. I want. I wanted to open that door, and I, I'm glad. I know that your I, instinct will be like, "Oh, I have these other interviews. I want to use them. I want to do more of these." But the truth is, like, this snapshot of this time where America is a little, I don't want to say broken, but we're not sure where we're going. Certainly we going off balance. Towards, towards dictatorship. Uh, you know, I always say Trump will be president for the next 30 years. <laughs> you know, there's no way he's letting go. Right, that's true. And you start to see the points you make, sometimes inadvertently. It's really fascinating. Thank you, man. I say I was talking to one of my good friends, Jordan Temple. He's a great comedian in Brooklyn. And he's out working right now. And he's, you know, we're all going through a little. We have lost some friends. A couple mm -hmm. comics yes. uh, passed away. And we're going through a rough time. And we're always checking in with each other. And he was checking in on me while I was watching your documentary. And it was during the Liberia scene. I was like, yo, man, we're fine. Yeah. Our lives are great. Yeah. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. I was like, well, it's true. It's true. I mean, the thing that, you know, whether you are proud to be an American or not, when you experience those things, as I'm sure you have felt the same thing, I, when I come home, I'm really glad to be an American. I know how lucky we are. Again, luck. Right. Privilege. Privilege. And you we, use your privilege. You say, I'm the white guy in the suit. Yeah. And yeah. I go there and I get things done. And, you know, you're directing, but you're also producing. And you're also, in a way, you're also sort of making people feel at ease with your privilege. And you're, yes. you're going in uh, with your run and gun crew. And, oh, uh, man. When I was a kid, and I know this podcast ended 20 minutes ago, <laughs> but this is such an important subject to me because it really, you really did hit something in me with this film. 
I'm very glad. When I, I, I would sit in my classes and I would hear about the Holocaust. I would hear about dictatorships. I would hear about, you know, the Inquisition. You'd hear about how awful it is in, in communist China and uh, they're waiting online in Russia. You know, I'm growing up in the 70s and 80s. And the one thing I remember, I would always doodle on my notebooks with swastikas. Yeah, me too. And I bet you did also. They all, look cool. All, all Jewish kids. <laughs> I did it in Hebrew school. I would do it in the sitter. You know, I wow. mean. That, why, why do you think we did that? It was forbidden. It was bad. It was the authority. You were kind of re rebelling. Against. <laughs> What's the worst thing you could do as a Jew is like sort of <laughs> pretend to be a Nazi for a minute. You know? uh, I did the worst thing you could do as a Jew. Yes. I knocked up a rabbi's daughter. There you go. There you go. <laughs> That's another story for another podcast. There you go. But the, yes. the swastika. Yeah. They're fun when you figure out, you know, as you kid, but, but yeah. the you point figure out how to draw it. It's like, oh, wow, I could do, I could draw a swastika. It's exciting. Takes you know half a second. Yeah, but but I think the, the cups, reason I did that's it different. Yeah. The cups that they did with the beer, the beer cups yeah. that takes a lot of work. You know that took some organization. You know, uh, but I didn't do that, so uh, I wouldn't be allowed to waste those cups. By the way, that would be. A... <laughs> what are you doing with all the cups? My mother wouldn't care. There was a swastika. It's just like, you took all the cups out of the cup. What are you doing? <laughs> See, I think I did it because it was freedom of speech. Like, if I did that anywhere else, I could get my, my, my fingers so chopped true. off. I, you know, I snuck into Cuba, you know, a long time ago, and, and people won't even mention the name Fidel Castro. They'll just, right. they'll just you know, pull on their beard, <laughs> and yeah. they, they say it without saying it. Yes. Whereas in this country, we're so lucky. Anything goes. You really, nobody's coming in and grit pull you off stage yet. Even in England, you know? there was a few jokes I had to cut from my next project because it's going to air in England and they're very sensitive about making fun of the Queen and jokes like that where, right. you know, to, to, for us, I just... It's right. nonsense. We have no respect for anything. <laughs> Let's face it. It's kind of That's beautiful. America. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. I always say life is hard. We're getting through it together. Thank you, Larry Charles. Thank you, Ed. This was really fun. No problem. Thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. All right. We got some plugs. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get through here if you don't mind. <clears throat> Jeff's coming this Saturday, March 9th, to Levity Live in Oxnard, California. Get out. Get those tickets. They're going. 329 and 330. He'll be out at the Brea Improv in Brea, California. 510 and 511 at the La Jolla Comedy Store. Big news. Bumping mics. Coming back. 524 in the Sands, Bethlehem. That's where we started. I yeah. love that place. Yeah, that was your first big road show. And it's Me a and huge Dave, theater. I've, I've talked them into two shows so far. And yeah. We're doing the Borgata the next night. At the Music Box on 525. Go check those shows out. And you're doing this new thing, Cameo. It's really fun. Gilbert Godfrey got me into this thing called Cameo, where go to cameo.com, or I think you can download the app, and we make funny videos, and you can you can send them to your friends. Yeah, you can have Jeff roast your friends for a small fee. <laughs> it, is, it is a hilarious thing. It's really thing. the it's most fun so you can ever have while I'm on my toilet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go and rate and review us on iTunes and check us out on Spotify. We're making a big baby. And if you got any uh, questions about the podcast, you like what you're hearing, you can email us directly at thickskinwithjeffross at gmail. Our Instagram is thickskinwithjeffross and Twitter at thickskincast. Love you guys. Love you, Ed. Thank you, bud. This is so much fun. Really Great having time. you here, Larry. My pleasure, man. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Anytime, by the way. Anytime. I, I, I won't ask you the question that everybody hates, which is, what's next? Because <laughs> you're not topping this, bro. I don't have an answer. It's not yeah. happening. Yeah, yeah. You're not topping it. I'm unemployed. That's what's I think next. you should just get out of Dodge. <laughs> <laughs> Buy a fucking ranch, Larry. I'm out of show business as it is. I mean, believe me. It's not... <laughs> Congrats, man.